Welcome everybody to the uh, Delgado Reading Series. Today we have a wonderful poet, Dr. Mona Lisa Sloy, to read for you. But before that, we have a student, DeAndre Coleman, who will introduce Dr. Sloy. Welcome DeAndre Coleman to the stage, please. Zoop, there's the bowl. 
And that's us in the seventh ward. So that's where we live, but that's the home of jazz. That's where Jelly Roll Morton built from. And people like Joe Jones and even Alan Toussaint spent his last decades in the seventh ward. So I mean, the food is great, the black Indians are great. And I call them black warriors. And so I'm trying to represent that culture. And I'm going to read a few things from each book and a couple of new pieces. And I hope you enjoy it. Sankofa is in the Akan people of West Africa. It's a the image of a bird. It's also a proverb that says you look forward, you look back so that you can go forward. So it's usually a two-headed bird looking like that. And when you travel to places like Paris and Britain and you see the ironwork, even in the French quarters, that symbol is there. It's kind of upside down, but the way it, it's like a heart upside down, but the angles go to both sides. And that's Sankofa. So the original iron workers here were Yoruba people, and we now know that we were, our ancestors were sought for their skills, things like that. So I'm not going to preach, but <laughs> so Sankofa looks back to the uniqueness that is our culture here. Sankofa Nova. Our names return two, three, or four centuries to ancestors shipped here like sardines. Saltwater Africans, coupled to Euro English, Irish, French, German, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Filipino, or natives, Choctaw, Halma, Natchez, and Alabama, others far and wide, more recently Vietnamese, Latinos from Honduras to Mexico. These families with roots like the live oaks firmly planted, then arms embracing and arching over us like an umbrella against torrential wars, winds, diseases, disappointments. Bring our African selves and souls to echo from Cuba, Haiti, all points, Caribbean, Central America, to carve lives into New Orleans, Caribbean North, we call it, into neighborhoods like Gentilly, Sugar Hill, Treme, Hollyland, so many others, resonating into celebrating births, baptisms, confirming cultural dances of sorrow songs, blues, jazz, reggae, and burying our dead in rocking home-going gospel celebrations with horse-drawn carriages of solemn dirges of grief. Then handkerchief flying, trombone blasting, second line dances, celebrating a life well lived. So we can cry, smile, and continue masking until the next Mardi Gras. There's a whole lot of praying in between. The altar candles lit in promises of faith, the novenas of devotion to our Lord, venerating saints like Anne, Joseph, and saving sinners, cleansing souls, blessing each day, each week, each decade, each century, the promise of better for generations to come. Not hurricanes, not tornadoes, not torrential shifts can sway such steady faith and love of God family, community, firmly planted for centuries, Creoles, who know how to live and do well daily. La joie de vivre ain't no big mati, no big lie. <laughs> love always, committed to caring. One family, one block, one church. Again, many Cubanos, Haitians, Puerto Rican, Creole cultures together, celebrating each one's crafts teaching each one's generations, grounded in this Crescent City landscape of Camellia, Bougainvillea, Hydrangea, Iris, incipient Pontchartrain clay with small mosquitoes and sunshine. who we are as a people. And I was sharing with Deandra, we both had traveled to Paris and I was able to study there and I had to support at one point and research there. And I was so excited. I mean, we grew up here, Patty, and you want to go. And every day I walked outside and saw these 
brothers picking up the garbage. And they looked at me like I was dirt and it broke my heart. So I kept wanting to say, who are we here? And unfortunately, we just don't know each other anymore, but we're so much more alike than we are different all over the world. And as I've traveled, I've learned that. But anyway, this is called Frontliners. We came after World War II, the doo-wop kids, the original teenagers who believed in America, those second-class citizens, the last Jim Crow generation, often imitated from Jolson to Elvis, our beat took the chillin' circuit to juke joints and nat nightclubs back of town. We made bandstand and Motown, anointed the world with soul and the Afro, sold freedom into America's vote, and believed there was a place for us in the land of the free. So the youth moved north, bit the bitter freedom of blank faces where everyone's from someplace else, the taste of a modern era. Where's the black community now? In double dutch contests, sponsored by McDonald's or under the neon moon at the Grammys. I can count the black men my age on one hand. There's good brothers, married bloods, died or wish they'd died in Vietnam brothers. Street brothers are dying now in prison ones. Warriors left brothers now on the front lines. Hold on to their blackness and sanity like a last meal. Where's the black community now? Burrowed warmly in our hearts, rising in a melody or two, or a good gospel shout at Sunday service. From Atlantic to Pacific, we send our love by stamp or phone call or email. See our traditions on dance floors of clubs where DJs scratch the tenders and Reeboks or Jordash and guest jackets. Oh yeah, we still speak black. Ghetto Ease is now hip enough to get airplay from radio to video to texting to social media, you know. And the times are tighter than a turtle's tail. The government won't give a crippled crab a crutch. So we smell of sweat and the sobbing of lean years. We know how to cry and hold each other, no, ma no matter how many statistics publish lies about how we don't or can't stay married. We've looked north long enough, so promises fade with each dusk. We grew inside America like oak trees in Louisiana pine. <laughs> the eagle still pays up. We pinch the nickels in our pockets till the buffalo squeals, and thank God for weekends. We grow lean. Dig soul on the commute to work, whisper on sidewalks and celebrate minutes. Our skip, children skip to used to be just ghetto blasters or MP3 players, but now <laughs> we escaped America's change like chameleons. We know how to live, jusqu'au bon temps roulé, until the good times roll. All right. My name really is Mona Lisa. I had nothing to do with it. It's my daddy's fault. And when I was a little kid, I caught so much flack for it because my buddies would say, you look like an old white lady. Or then as you grow, and my, and my uncles, whenever I walked into a room, they sang to me, and I thought, oh my god, they made a song for me. And then you grow up and you realize, nope, it's not your song. <laughs> And so I met Mona Lisa's everywhere. We were a generation and a half difference in age because Nat King Cole was on the radio and then the TV. And I don't know if you know this story, but he was actually a jazz pianist. And his combo in the, at the end of the 40s was given the opportunity to broadcast nationally on the radio. First time ever. And the crooner, the sweet boy singer, didn't show up until so the combo said, man, you got to sing this song. He said, I'm not a singer. I'm a jazz pianist. And they said, you got to sing this song. We are not leaving here. So he sang the song, and the rest, of course, is history. It became a national hit. And then, of course, he had his own TV show, which ran in reruns. So I'm talking about a decade and a half of exposure to Nat King Cole. And it was the joy, of, great joy of my life to meet his son when I was poet in residence at, this is a mouthful, the African American Historical and Cultural Society in San Francisco in the film. And 
They had a wonderful museum and library. We ran black writers workshops. And his son was there, and he heard this poem. He just didn't know. So it touched me that he was touched. So anyway, here's my story. Black Mona Lisa's, no, excuse me, Nat King Cole babies and Black Mona Lisa's. Everybody asks, really? Is Mona Lisa your name? Hmm. Hey, Da Vinci's daughter, huh? Or they call another name of note. Mm-hmm, I'm Muhammad Ali. Or you call a friend, leave your name, and they say, is some picture calling you? Or they do a double take, say what? See, we are late World War II boom babies, cuddled, loved, conceived, on backs of pickups, back porches, and starlit rooms to Nat King Cole. The last sister I met named Mona Lisa came from Chicago in beaded braids. She was a waitress at the Oakland Athletic Club. It was Kwanzaa. She said, hey girl, like she knew me. I said, yeah. It was a radio hit, Nat King Cole sang it on his own TV show. In the 1950s, everybody sang Mona Lisa. Well, Mona Lisa Wilson and I went to Xavier Prep with her. Mona Lisa Carr was a year older at Joseph S. Clark High, then a trade high school, real cute, a fine cheerleader. I never knew her, but I hated her to myself was ashamed by myself, too. My daddy bears most claim to calling me. Mother said I was his baby girl, and he thought they weren't still able. Cousin Mildred says she told him to do it. Said the Mona Lisa was on loan from the Louvre, all oh, in the news. My daddy says in World War II, the day he saw the Mona Lisa, he saw little French boys catching rats for food in the streets. And he brought them his rations, and he thought, if he just had another baby girl. <laughs> so my sister hated me for so long, and my brother didn't pay no mind about names, except Junior. He would sing the Mona Lisa song to me, like Uncle Toot and Uncle Herbert at a piano, Uncle Clifford and Mr. Charles. Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, men have named you. You're so like the lady with the mystic smile. Is it only because you're lonely they have made you? Or is it that Mona Lisa strangeness in your smile? Do you smile to tempt the lover, Mona Lisa? Or is it your way to hide a broken heart? Many dreams have been brought to your doorstep. They just lie there and they die there. Are you warm? Are you really Mona Lisa? Or just a cold and lonely, lovely work of art? Now the late 60s cursed European namesakes, but I reminded many I was born black on a black block in the seventh ward on the backside of New Orleans. And I always thought Mona Lisa was Nat King Cole's lover like sweet Lorraine. I recalled Iris, Janice, and Joan. Iris had green eyes. Mustard tan skin. She was littler than me, and we always fought for something. Janice had blue eyes, blonde hair, solid blood. Her daddy, Mr. John, was handsome, dark tan with thick Latin brown hair, and she beat me regularly. Now, Joan was jet black with short, short black hair, and I knew they called her a tat behind her back till I come around, because I knew they called my mother that. Well, Joan thought I was too yellow and didn't know why I wanted to be with her. But she was the only one could outswim, outdraw, outmake-believe anybody. Well, they all called me a nappy-headed yellow nigga between scratching and pulling hair. <laughs> Mona Lisa got nappy hair, Mona Lisa got nappy hair. So about the time I stopped frying my hair, stopped slapping lye on it or trying tint, Sun Ra told me I look like the Oni, or a Zulu queen and told me my hair is sculptured to crown my nappiness. And I'll always remember Nat King Cole singing to me, loving me like my uncles. Thank you, thank you so much. So things are a bit different, it's pandemic time. Oh, God help us. <laughs> but as a kid coming up, and I have to tell you, a lot of these poems came out of me remembering. I forget who, which artist, which writer, I think it was a sculptor who said that art 
is memory revisited, but this is called On My Block, which was very different then. But I lost my memory in a bad car accident, and I started writing to remember, and so some of these are those memories. On My Block. On my block, the milkman sells dream books and nickel bets once a week. Never paid much mind. Never paid much mind. Chicken wire fences keeps out stray cats and kids. Pecan tree branches hold clotheslines, wrinkled sheds, and army blankets that shade the sun from big galvanized tubs of shrimp, oysters, and crawfish. Never paid much mind. Louisiana red clay tracks every living room floor each summer till it smokes in red clouds when air never cools but lights up with fireflies dancing. Never paid much mind. On my block, the heat sticks to my throat and steams off the bank at the sidewalk. If you spill a hucklebuck or a snowball cone, never paid much mind. Smiling faces from coconut milk to copper to coffee say, hey now, or what you know? Never paid much mind. Never paid much mind. And then, of course, I write this poem. It was published, I forget where. And they said, there's no red clay in Louisiana. It was bust in, or <laughs> trucked in, but it was everywhere when I was a kid. Ugh. And you know, filling those potholes. <laughs> and this is another one from that time, Heritage. Shortening bread mornings with spittoon twangs. Spilled hot toddies render horse flies suicidal. Twelve shoe shines and a 90 minute John Wade later, Jay walked to the elementary block with the big kids. Starch khaki boys and navy pleated girls pay draft to patrol kids. Hip Eddie D's and sassy Anna Mays swap pint sized lies in the second grade line. Peanut butter or cold chicken necks or paper bag because lunch collections are skimmed regularly by the bad boy. Plantains or banana fritter desserts top jello any day. We hand bone down through recess and do a signified stroll to the national anthem all the way back to class. On hot afternoons of Bible history, the neighborhood cleaners man collects numbers money and translates those dream books. At three, we play coon can in the streets and race home on sugar cane stilts before dinner nears. Catching crawfish by the tail under the house hightails, three mud blobs in one tub. That soap, that soap never saw white again. Jambalaya and red wine dinners ease the heat, privacy needs in a shotgun home with mother's prayers as the burnt orange sky opens. I was blessed to, I'm blessed to have three brothers, but my cousin, his, we lost his mom when he was two, and we're six months apart in age, so we grew up in the same house, Dwight and he. This is called My Cousin, My Brother. When I think of home, D, I remember you and me playing in the dirt in our backyard on New Orleans Street, or getting shouted at by mama, our grandmother, for doing almost anything related to breathing or walking. One time that returns to me in dreams and memory, one of the many times we played too close to Mama's Roses, and something about Alton and a beehive. Remember Alton? Must have been six feet tall, or so he seemed. And he had big, fat, gentle hands, a middle like Santa's, and his caramel face always smiling at us, unless we hurt his feelings or something, imitating his slurred speech. He groaned and mentally challenged us too young and ignorant of life from his eyes. Anyway, this one time, Mama caught us good, you with a slap across the head, and me getting dragged by my nappy pigtails. Must have been the one of many times we tried drowning Yellow Jacket's beehive in Mama's garden. But it was her precious rose petals that fell and the yellow prison striped bees running Alton into a frenzy. <laughs> we were happy and proud of such original fun. It almost made our whippings worth it. <laughs> and while I was convinced we had the meanest grandmother in the world, 
It made us closer as we huddled, crying and angry to be separated from play and each other for days like a lifetime. And now you, a man of music and God, of family and friends, with time for hibiscus, jasmine, and me. Being from South Ward and growing up black Catholic, I went to Epiphany. If you lived on the other side of Dershowa, you went to Corpus Christi. If you went to public school, you went to Galena C. Jones, which we're still trying to bring back. We're not giving up in the neighborhood. But we caught three buses to get uptown to Xavier Prep, which is now Drexel Prep, but it was Xavier University Preparatory High School. And so we always passed through the quarters. And oh my god, it was an adventure. So these two poems come out of that, the witnessing of the quarters when we were still very young. French Market Morning. New Orleans tourists have coffee on the river most mornings. Beer brewing stench and shelled oysters overpower the chicory odor this butter shine morning. The levee is a public park now. Slaves were sold there. Once only black folks cooked, waited tables, and swept floors in this cafe. Aunt Jemima dolls are made in China now. White cooks are in the kitchen. Asian and white waiters at the tables, too. The free food line is long and black. Black survival wears a different face. Its pain is older than this market. French market friend. Pecans, pecans from the country by the pound. What have you, Missy? He was an ancient peddler, 70-something, seven years ago. Sold the freshest everything. Been peddling over 50 years, me and me brother. A tourist run over him last year. His shoulders stooped from watermelon weight and time. Still six feet, his West Indian coffee color bronzes in New Orleans winter sun. He remembered me every fall, he said. My Catholic school uniform, African Asian looking eyes, a few pennies tipped with each mango. So, you a lady now, hey? Pretty little afro, too. And you never forgot old Mose de Bitter. Mose filled my lunch bag once a week with free plarines, fresh fruit, and his stories. Hey, Missy, tell him. Tell him you had coffee with chicory at Cafe du Monde with Mozambique du Con. Tell him for me. Tell him. This one is also a childhood poem, recycling neighborhood style. Before anybody had more than five cents for a fat peppermint candy stick, and before Nintendo or He-Man or Barbie, black or white, before we heard the word recycle, we made our toys out of coke tops, played double jacks with them, used them for lost jacks to nail them to old anything for decor. We skated until we dropped. Then outgrown skates became skateboards or skatemobiles for block derbies. We'd nail coke tops to spell our names on the mobiles, or nail them to rotten wooden fences to make secret codes. We made miniature floats with miniature flags from torn shirts, clipped to wooden clothespins waving in humid heat for miniature Mardi Gras parades on the bank at the sidewalk. Clean long neck coke bottles made shapely dolls. Just add mop strings for hair. Hand sew the latest fashions out of scraps from castaway clothes. Clean bottle tops, caps made now you see it, now you don't games. When the nut was a milk bug or an empty peanut shell. Don't mention mother's clothesline too long. Worth gold bouillon. Cut, it made great twists to set long, wet, nappy hair for curls when dry. Wet, we twist and roll that line in our hair until our arms dropped. Next day, curls, curls, kinky curls, good enough to make Shirley Temple cry. Recycle. <laughs> now, better was clothesline jump rope, single or double dutch, egg beater jump rope with mother's clothesline. Lord, we thought we did it. Best of all was catching mosquito hawks by their paper thin wings. We'd watch them hover like a helicopter or a hummingbird. We'd sit still like a blade of grass and swoop on the poor mosquito hawk, swoosh it into a cleaned out peanut butter jar. Then we'd comb the gravel and oyster shell streets for cigarette butts. 
and fed our prize hawk tobacco. <laughs> Ever seen a drunk mosquito hawk? <laughs> Better than Rambo or a Ter or Terminator movie. Better than Pac-Man. Only thing better was a drunk lizard or a high praying mantis. Yes, we did. Got mosquito hawks drunk on cigarette butts. Recycling. <laughs> we didn't know we were poor. <laughs> <laughs> time for all of us. This pandemic has been so unusual. Something like this hasn't happened for over 100 years, so we are all more awake. I take joy when I read my student papers at Delhi University, and they tell me that they read more, are more thoughtful, that they speak to their families more than they ever did, that they don't rush around as much, and they're learning more about themselves. And, but one of the things they one of the things they all express is losing people. We've all buried too many people, elders, neighbors, young people. So in New Orleans we bury people a special way. It's part of our African sacred tradition. And I just read another article, it was on Vox, and they get it wrong. The second line is not the line behind the trumpets or the, the horns. It's the return from the grave, celebrating a life well lived. Now, what we see in the street is a second line party because it's more commercialized now. That's okay, but don't get the history wrong. So anyway, this is about that time when we have to bury people. It's called The Last Mile, taken from the title of my grandmother's favorite hymn, The Last Mile of the Way, which if you look it up, it says it's written by Johnson Oakland Jr., but Sam Cooke wrote that. It's on his first album, his first complete album, The Sam Cooke. I'll give you a little taste of it, I'll read the poem, and then I'll finish it. The last one. I'll read. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I work till the close of the day, Lord, I shall see the great king in his beauty when I've gone the last mile of the way. The last mile. It comes like a rider on a horse. You hear it long before it arrives. The empty silence broken like a clap of thunder or in a scared heart too beaten to break. You smell it too. The rock coming in slowly, the way gnats and moths wander toward light. If you're lucky, it's announced, devil's bread growing in a yard, still an unwelcomed visitor. Digging it up melts the fungus, but death keeps coming like termites and lice in an old shed. So within the city of the living, we prepare for the city of the dead. The quiet place of narrow St. Augustine line walkways, of cement covered brick, our marble and granite slab tombs stacked like little houses above the ground. Listing families and friends long gone. First, take off shoes, and no new shoes at the Sunday sir, at the service or cemetery, or the dead will rise jealous to get them to you. Second, cover mirrors, mirrors so the soul can't stay here. Next, unplug clocks, stop time, and face the dead east to meet God in glory, and the here will be gone after now. Then awake, the last visit with the shell, the effigy of the one gone. Last respects for the living who loved and love on. It may be for an evening, even a week, a chance to pray and wish the soul well on its way, its new life after living. Now the living bake and cook for kin so they may grieve and suspend caring for three days. That's the first line. Then grieve and cry and ache and holler and faint from loss and emptiness, for the spaces once filled no more, for the times together alive in memory only, so the living may go on again until the next time. In the city of the dead, where the clean whitewashed tombs are flooded with flowers, mums mostly, 
Incarnations of every hue, a lily or two among wrought iron fences, or in vases on the small shelves. Here the rich and famous bear epitaphs. The family of the widow Paris, famille de Bido Perry, ne la Vauborn, la Vaucigit, here lies Marie Philon Glavion, Daisy Day, the 11th of June, 1897, deceased June 11, 1897. Age 62 ans, 62 years old, and football mayor. She was a good mother. Mon ami a a good friend and regretté par tout, missed by all. Si qui l'en connu ou knew her, passant prier pour elle, passes by, please pray for her. St. Louis Cemetery number one. In the city of the dead, you can visit, kneel the stations of the cross at St. Rock Cemetery, make a novena and pray a petition with lit candles for favors, or pilgrimage on Good Friday, when you can pray and leave money at each of nine churches, and a husband is promised before the year ends. For luck, pick a, pick a four-leafed clover, the red ones from the blood of a bride-to-be whose suicide marks her grave here. The last release is the best, the second line dance. Dance, swoon, ride your grief like there's no tomorrow. The melodies will sway like waves in a hurricane, hurried, smashing, then softly calm before the last rush of grief. There is a sadness in the silence after death. Then grieve and cry and ache and holler and faint from loss and emptiness, for the spaces once filled no more, for the times together, alive in memory only, so the living may go on again until the next time. As I walk the last mile of the way, I will rest at the close of the day. And I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile. for a happy ending. <laughs> and Hallmark Channel calls February Love You Merry Month. <laughs> so in honor of Love You Merry Month, I'm going to read a little love poem. It's very short. It's a sonnet. When we. When I need you to hold me and you lean just inches away, maybe I can't tell you how I need to sometimes. Sounds easy that one can just say something to someone, but some words come like bricks in your throat, and the brow bleeds, and female parts butterfly, and I surrender to your need for a hug in your eyes when you can't tell me, but I hear it in your purr sometimes, in your pouring over me like honey, hot and golden, touching inch by inch, finger to fold in heat, and the way those chestnut eyes follow me like an airplane when we need to be held and we can't say. And every time we have a disaster in this country, or especially in Louisiana, we had other storms and people, and all of us had damage from Ida. I'm still Wi-Fi crazy. But after the storm, it was as hard as it was for us to come back. It was as difficult for our churches. And I can tell you, I left the Catholic Church when I was a teenager because I was angry. And I, but that taught me, and I was angry because the priest came to our house to tell us that we should have never been born because our parents were divorced. And I'm a teenager who buried my mother. I thought it was the most cruel thing ever. It wasn't Christian. So I left the Catholic Church, so I became a Baha'i. I became a Buddhist. I became a Nishra and Shoshu Buddhist. I became Church of Religious Science. I became Wose African Community Church, and God knows what else, but always looking for God. So when I returned home after the storm, the 
not just the Catholic churches, but even the Methodist churches, the Episcopalians, they had to combine because there weren't enough people here to support the community. And so one of the things I witnessed was that joy of returning to worship on Sunday. So I am a black Catholic, practicing Catholic, and we have a rock and gospel mass on Sundays at 10 o'clock in St. Raymond, St. Leo the Great. And I was trying to capture just how important worship is. And one of the, and I think it was Ida, it was a little place, I can't think of the name of the place, but it was one of the small towns outside of the city, and we were talking about how they didn't know if their church was there, could they make it? And I know the inspiration that that gives, so this is an honor of all those people who are trying to bring back their churches. Sundays in New Orleans, or Louisiana worship. Sundays we visit mysteries we cannot see. Forgiveness yellow, penance purple, Crucifixion red, resurrection white. We learn that change is God's gift. No two leaves, no two clouds. No two stars, no two skies. No two hands or hurricanes. No two faces, no two smiles. No two birds, no two rocks. No two days ever alike. Sacred songs fill our chests full of peace, overflowing with possibility. Hope crowns the muddy Mississippi, cradles the Crescent City, punctuates the steps to nowhere, the spaces between neighborhoods, Katrina beaten doorways, families, too stubborn to leave sidewalks that echo Creole generations of la joie de vivre. Our city blocks from the ninth ward to the seventh ward to mid city smile, toothless, missing homes now demolished, families lost to Gonzales, Vashri, Houston, Black Lantern, and all points out of here. Homes standing rebuilt, some new, high as young oak trees, bought with fortitude, heart, patience, and more penance paid to faceless government loans, a few government grants spread willy-nilly avoiding need. So Sundays, we thank you, Jesus. We made it over. We made it over, we made it over, we made it over. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We made it over, we made it over. And I'm going to end on this. It's called End Notes. Southerners sip cafe au lait with galette, pan fried and flat like the dreams, raindrops this morning. We smell the rain before it comes to visit. The damp aroma, it's calling card. All legs, feet, and hay nows, the sun kissed us olive from New World, Louisiana Creole gumbo, like the gray eyes of whatever's in the kitchen sink, with meliton, parsley, and onion to taste. No one yells, cause we carry how you doings and see who plays between pacones. We save our clothes, make groceries, wash and scrub the porch and the banquet with lye after Hucklebuck spills or boil crawfish leavings to clean and erase evil spells. No insults shake us, naivete warms us. Our hands tougher, toughen after sewing machine needles tattoo lies of customs and costumes each Mardi Gras. We outlaugh enemies, close louvers to their curses, retreat to the gallery where lemonade and laughter lives. <laughs> I ready my handkerchief and umbrella for the next second line and catch new tales. Thank you so much for listening. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? I think we're all in awe. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I sing in the choir, and I'm not a soul. I'm going to tell my cousin you said that. <laughs>
I was. Me too. Hey, I still read their books. Me too. I love them. I love them. I had boxes of those that drowned in, in Katrina water. Remember these was there when you were there? No, I, I did that on the West Coast. Me too, San Francisco. Ah, San Francisco. Yeah. God knows where. I went to a bunch of churches, but I'm telling you because I was always hopping. I lived in San Francisco, but before the... Yeah, I lived in San Francisco first, then I moved to the East Bank, East Bank. and I lived to, I say East Bank, but I lived in, right at the Oakland Berkeley border, mm -hmm. near the Ashby yeah. Station. Yes. Yeah. And, Me too. ah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, you have to holler at me. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. I grew up in the third Ah, go ahead, my sister. <laughs> so, what university, I missed that part. Where? You know, where did you attend? Okay, so I, my mother died when I was a teenager, and my dad was grieving and drinking too much. Never missed a day of work, but it was an uneasy thing because he would not just invite people over to drink and have liquor. He had served their favorite liquor. <laughs> so it was too many men with me being single, passing through my bedroom in the single shotgun, in the double shotgun. So the black real women in the neighborhood say, it's time for you to go. So when I finished high school, I went to the West Coast to see my sister, and she made me go to college. When I tell you I went kicking and screaming, and because of that, I took to it like a crawfish to mud and never looked back. That was at the University of Washington, where I had the honor of teaching for two years after Katrina, because there was no place to live. And Dillard wasn't back yet. And we were really devastated the campus. So I did undergraduate there. And I became a poet there. Again, writing to remember after that car accident. And I met young writers who said, you talk like a writer. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> and so they brought me to their mentor, Dr. Colleen McElroy, who became my mentor. Charles Johnson, American Book Award winner, my mentor. I mean, so many writers that I met. Even the great William Stafford told me, he said, yeah, you're a poet. He was elderly than I said, oh, thank you, God. So I just never looked back. So then I went to graduate school first at San Francisco State University, where I taught a few years after graduation and was in the Bay Area, the Fillmore, and then the other side of the Bay. And then I returned home, and I have to share this story because I was in residence at the Historical Society, consulting to the Afro-American Museums Association. And they treated me to a trip home. I was in heaven. I said, what are you going to fly me to New Orleans? And it was the year of the World's Fair. So here I come from this black library and museum where the secretary on the board of directors had been W.E.B. Du Bois' secretary for 30 years. So we're talking black intellectuals from generations that I could learn from. And it was just a thrill. So they sent me home. And who received us? First Lady of the City, Sybil Morio, and Danny Barker, the great jazz banjo player. And they kept telling us that the youth went north and left to get an education, and there was a brain drain. I was home the next year. <laughs> and again, never looked back. So then I, there was no work because there was a, a glut of people leaving because of it was the oil companies had left right after that. And I said, well, I better study. So I went back to school, and I was recruited at LSU for the, they wanted me for the MFA. I said, oh, I don't want a PhD. Because I had a master's degree in writing, and at that time, I didn't even understand the politics of, of having a continuous job in the academy. And so if I really wanted the life of a professor, I needed a PhD, and so I negotiated. And, they let me go, so I did the MFA and PhD at LSU. And it's a big blessing, so I'm thankful. Very thankful. And I've been at Dillard since, and I, I taught at LSU too, I taught at LSU for six and a half years, and then came here, came back home, worked at Dillard, so I'm very thankful. So I've had quite a life in the academy, although a late bloomer. <laughs> but it pays off, so hang in there. It pays off. An average undergraduate degree with one, you'll make a million and a half more dollars than people without in your lifetime. And that means a lot. 
for stability, for you. And when I was a kid, they said you have to take care of the underclass before you can get in the overclass. So you have to take care of yourself and then help your family and your community. And that was how I was raised. So keep investing in yourself, keep learning. And how sweet is that to keep learning? You're never bored. <laughs> There's always something to investigate and grow from, and it's just such a pleasure. So I'm thankful to have a room full of books, and it's where I spend my money. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? What are some of your favorite poets? Oh my God, so many. I, all the greats, all the greats, from Langston to Sonia to Sonia Sanchez to Oh my God, Alice Walker, I love her poetry. I love Patricia Smith. I love Jericho Brown is my former student, Pulitzer Prize winner. And so many, so many, so many. And Theodore Redke. I mean, William Stafford, I loved his work. I, there are just so many, hundreds and hundreds of poets. And I'm still enjoying many more. Muriel Ruckheiser. Love her. Just great, great writers. Joy Harjo, our national poet laureate, indigenous woman, is celebrating an unprecedented third term as the United States Poet Laureate. I love her work. Roberta Hill Whiteman, another indigenous poet. Love her. And Tozaki Shange, you gotta love that sister. <laughs> There's just so many, many, many. Someone else, anyone? Yes? So you mentioned that you did uh, research on black poets. Mm -hmm. um, what were your like, favorite poets during that time, and how do you think like, you can uh, honor your legacy um, during like, a time that was so like, predominantly white, predominantly male, and like, just make sure that their legacy is intact and not like, white? Well, I've been trying to correct that because Bob Kaufman is the brother who took Ginsburg into the Negro streets at Dunlop during that time. And that's how they learned the jazz of the lingo and appropriated it. But Bob Kaufman was born and raised right here in Southport. And I read him for my dissertation as a Southern writer, so I'm determined to finish that biography. And he was close to Ginsburg. And the other thing is, see, he worked for the unions. He, was, he left here. And ironic that now, the McDonald number 19, he lived at one point with his family across the street. He couldn't go to school there. He had to walk all the way to Albert Wicker to get his grade schooling, high school, because he couldn't attend that school. So I know he's rolling in his grade. Not only did Ruby Bridges integrate it, but it's going to be a museum now. So, I mean, it's changed, thank God. But Bob Kaufman is one. Amir Baraka was Leroy Jones, another. And there are quite a few, as a matter of fact, a few women, too, who get ignored. So I've written some articles on that. Matter of fact, the, the New York Museum of Art published my article on the Black Beats. So you might be able to find that online. It's in a big coffee table book, too. I was honored to do that in the 90s. So I've been doing that research and writing about them because of that. And even, and he, he spoke Castilian Spanish, but he was right here from the New And he still has family here. Still has family here. So I'm trying to correct that. There are other black beats. So check out Bob Crawford. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I'm taking up a lot of your time. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. She worked at the Community Book Center. She took her time to come here to buy a book. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Continue good fortune in all you do.